all the way from New Orleans. We have one of New Orleans finest. Mm. Guys, give it up for Stanton Moore and Ghost Note.
Live 2020, and we have Stanton Moore here talking about his setup. Yes, indeed. So, what we're doing here is I really like darker, drier, more focused sounds, sounds that blend with the music. I don't really like stuff to jump out and kind of take over or cut through the mix. I like things to blend. So that's why I'm choosing a lot of the Karopes because they have a really nice darker, slightly trashy, but, but focused and, and, and blending sound. So of course they are, they are in the spirit of the old K's, which of course I've always loved. And these are, these are a little bit trashy, but, but not too much so. And I find that this, these symbols that I've selected so far are blending with everything that I've been playing. I just came off of the Jam Cruise where I played eight different gigs with everything from a piano trio to Galactic to Les Claypool to Garage A Trois. I played outside on the pool deck, I played inside in the theater, I played in some smaller venues too, and the cymbals are sounding amazing with all these different situations. So that was a great way to break everything in right away. And what I've got over here is a 20 inch trash crash that Paul Francis helped me make. It's a prototype and I watched Paul as he hand hammered these giant craters or if you're in New Orleans, you would call these potholes. But I watched pa Paul hammer these out himself and they, this sounds amazing. And I've, I've got rivets in this one right now because when I play jazz, I, I have a trash crash with rivets and I put that over here. So I just wanted to make sure I had that in my palette so that when I go back to New Orleans and start playing with my piano trio, which I do on Tuesday nights when I'm in town, I wanted to make sure that I had that covered. So we've also made some other prototypes too that we're trying out, um, but uh, right now I'm, I'm selecting a lot of the Karope stuff and, uh, and I, I'm really digging it, it's great. You're using symbols that are crashable ride symbols basically, right? Yes, so I like to be able to crash and ride on all of my symbols and I think that's coming from from Mel Lewis, uh, you know, he very famously has said, you know, a good symbol should be a symbol that you can crash on and ride on. And so I really, I really like to, every symbol that I have, also be able to ride on it. Even this 18 up here, it sounds amazing when I ride on it. This trash crash, calling it a trash crash, I think might do it a slight disservice because I think that it's more versatile than just a trash crash. And, and it's, even though it is trashy, when you ride on it with a touch, a lighter touch, it's got a beautiful ride sound. That is trashy. It's beautiful in a trashy way. It's not a pretty or sweet sound. It's a very trashy sound, but, but still with definition and, and, and stick sound. And so I, I ride on this a lot uh, in my piano trio. I have it over here and I'll tilt it down just a hair so that I can ride on it right here. And I do that a lot with the piano trio. And I also have a, a lighter 20 with rivets that I'll put in this position when I play piano trio. Paul made me a beautiful light 20 with, with some, with some uh, rivets in it. And that 20 I'll put here when I play piano trio and then move the trash crash with rivets over here. But even the prototypes that we've been working on are still made out of bodies of Karopes. So everything I'm playing is in one way or another Karope and then we modified a few of them uh, to come up with some of the sounds that I like to have in my palette. And how about the hi-hats? Can you tell us what size they are and how they fit into your sound palette? Yeah, so I like bigger hi-hats. I like 15s. And of course, some people play bigger than that even. But I like 15s. I don't like, again, I don't like a sound that cuts through the music or the mix. So I really like the 15s because they they have a wider spread. They're not as as pinpointed 
with a bright articulation. They have a slightly mellower, I don't want to use the word slushy, but just a little bit rounder articulation than say a 14 or 13. And so I really, I like darker hi-hats that I can get a nice articulate closed sound for when I'm right? And then opening up, you know, on a nice slushy open hi-hat that you can ride on too. So I've been finding that these, these have been serving all of those purposes really well. So I've been super happy so far. And my symbols, I like to have a unified look to them so they look like they belong together in a family. And then I also like them to sound like a palette. So each one has its own function and its own sound, but when you play them together, you could say, oh, I see how these all fit together and how these all work together. They sound so good together too. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm loving them. I just wanted to take a minute to talk about your Vic Firth Stanton Moore signature drumstick. Yes. So the stick I designed with cymbal playing in mind. And I've been playing these a little bit. I have a very pinpointed acorn tip. And people ask me, well, what's up with that acorn tip? And it's very deliberate. It's because I can then get a little bit more perpendicular to the cymbal, and I can get more articulation when I really have to get underneath a piano, like when I'm playing piano trio. I can get just get up here, and in playing jazz, I might even turn the ride cymbal down just a hair so that it's easier for me to get this more perpendicular angle so that the very tip of the stick is playing on the cymbal. And then that gives me a nice, focused, woody articulation. And then, if I wanted to, I could come back and play with this part of the stick and if I come back and play this part of the stick on closer to the edge of the cymbal, I'll get a completely different sound. Much wider, much broader, and I can use that more for larger ensemble playing, and I can get up here for more quiet, finessed, focused ride cymbal playing when I need it. I wanted to design this stick so that I could play every style of music that I encounter, which is everything from piano trio to heavier funk to sometimes heavier rock and, and even metal stuff. So the stick is 16 and a quarter and I did that on purpose so that if I need to play in a heavier situation I can just cock back on the stick a little bit if I have to so I get more leverage. I don't need more weight I just want a little more leverage. So I can choke up on here get on this tip and, and play really nice and light behind a, an acoustic piano or choke back and then start playing back here and, and then start playing with the shoulder of the stick and get more you know spread for, for even all the way up to heavy metal. And then we intentionally kept some girth here in, in the shaft of the stick because I do a lot of snare drum, New Orleans second line stuff and some rudimental stuff too and I wanted to have some weight up here so that all the snare drum stuff would, would feel good too. I didn't want to just design a cymbal stick that was just only designed for cymbal playing. So, and especially when I go around the toms and stuff, I really wanted something that still had some, some weight to it. So the stick really is essentially a slightly longer, slightly narrower 5A with an acorn tip. So, I mean, it's based off of an 85A, which is in between an 8D and a 5A, and then it's, it's just a quarter inch longer. So, I mean, if you think of it as a slightly, slightly thinner, slightly longer 5A with an acorn tip, then it's like, oh, well, let me check that out. And I've had a lot of people check it out and tell me that they're really pleased with the cymbal sound, and they really, they really dig the stick and especially being able to get that focused cymbal sound. And I mean, when you look at it, some people are like, well, what's up with that tip? But it's, it's very, 
there's a, a method to the to the madness of of that tip. And and when I came up with that acorn idea, I was actually just start started designing the stick with Vic himself, and he started sending me some drawings, and and we started with a much more pinpointed arrowhead, but acorn tip, but it was more of like a real arrowhead, and then. We modified that and then I eventually wound up sanding the tip down a little bit to get to, and I sent it back. And, and uh, I was working with Neil Larravee too. So between Nick and Neil Larravee and then Nick, I mean, um, and then Neil added the, the quarter inch back on the back of the end of the stick. So that, so I think I shaved like an eighth inch off and he added that back so that we had retained the full 16 and a quarter. So I've, I've been super happy with it. I designed it to be the only stick I'll need. And I mean, I think it's been over 10 years since we released it and it has been the only stick. Even when I play on a snare drum line occasionally, when I go sit in with uh, Brother Martin or LSU or any of the, the, the rudimental drum lines that I'll go sit in with, I still play this stick because it feels great to me and, and it's got enough body that uh, that even all the snare drum stuff feels great. That's amazing. I mean, for it to be so versatile that you're able to play it through all those styles. Yeah, I thought long and hard about it. I went through like every stick that Vic Firth makes, and and I just really thought long and hard, and and I, and I mean, to me, we nailed it because it's the only stick I play and have had to play for the last decade. That's the proof right there. Yeah. Right? And when you talk about all the different styles of music you play, you have some, you know, different instruments up here, different percussion instruments. Can you just t tell us a little bit about that and how that adds to your sound? Absolutely. So for me, being from New Orleans, I like to soak up all of the elements that New Orleans have, has to offer. So that's not just the slushy snare drum second line stuff. That's not just the Mardi Gras Indian stuff. It's not just the marching band drumline stuff. All of that stuff I try to add in to what I do in my groove playing and my funk playing. So, for example, this Pondero, which is my signature Pondero with LP, with this, I tune it super low and then we mic it from underneath and try to get a sound that's the sound of a floor tom mixed with a bass drum with jingles. Because in the streets of New Orleans, they play bass drums turned over this way with mallets and they'll parade down the streets with that. And, it's, and then you've got all these tambourine players playing too. So I'm trying to get that sound, right? And then here's another Pondero. I tune it up a little higher and I get two different distinct sounds and I can split up between them. And I'm trying to sound like multiple percussionists playing with myself, you know, playing with me. So I, I like to, I like to also incorporate these mini timbales and, uh, and, you know, cowbell over here, cowbell over here. This is all, I use these things in different grooves and, and ideas that I've worked up over time. And a lot of it is incorporating some of the sounds of the streets of New Orleans into what I'm doing. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And welcome to the family. Yeah. I couldn't be happier. Thank y'all. Yes, y'all have been great so far. It feels like a very natural, organic fit. And as you know, I've been working with, with Joe Testa, Mark Wessels, you too. Um, and so this has been a very welcoming transition and, and you guys have been great and I couldn't appreciate it more. Mm -hmm.